This podcast is brought to you by The Shift. This episode of the podcast is brought to you first and foremost by the patrons on the Storytime Superhero tier on Patreon. Please consider becoming a patron of the podcast if you aren't already. This podcast is also sponsored by Amazon Music. So Amazon Music Unlimited is a premium music subscription service that features over 70 million songs and thousands of expert programs, playlists and stations. With Amazon Music Unlimited, you can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere across all of your devices. You'll never see or hear an ad. And of course, you can download songs for or playlists for offline listening amazon music gets to know you personalizes your recommendations based on your listening habits from their catalog of 70 million songs and not only does it have songs but it also has podcasts and it is soon to have this very podcast which is very exciting so go to get amazonmusic.com forward slash clizair or click the link in the youtube YouTube description or in the show notes on the audio platforms. That's getamazonmusic.com forward slash clizair. That's spelled C L I S A R E. Getamazonmusic.com forward slash clizair to get your free 30 day trial. Cancel anytime for Amazon Music Unlimited. Let's get on with the episode. It's story time. Hello and welcome back to the Storytime Podcast. My name is Claire. I go by Clizair on the internet. And this is the podcast where guests come on to tell me their stories. And today I have with me Fionn Collins. Hello, Fionn. Hi, how are you doing? How are you? Uh, would you like to introduce Good. yourself, tell people where to find you on the internet? Yeah, of course. So my name is Fionn Collins, or some people know me on Twitter, Fionn McKill. My act on every social media is at you're no Fionn, so you are no Fionn. So it's supposed to sound like you're no fun, but not a lot of people get the I whole guess. idea. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a few people a few times to get it, but we're, we're here now to explain it. I actually might, I'm beginning to think I already follow you because Fionn McCool sounds really <laughs> familiar. Yeah, a lot. I've been introduced as Fionn McCool a few times anyway, so, uh, but no spoiler alert, that's not my actual uh, name. It's my stage name, as if you will. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I put all your links in, in the description on YouTube and in the audio platforms, but you have a story for me today. Of course, of course. So, um, like I said, hi everybody, my name is Fionn. Uh, I am 24. I'm the current Vice President for Welfare at the TWC campus and I'm also transgender. So I was born female, I identify as male. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, so that's how I identify. Uh, I'm also bisexual and I'm here to tell you a little bit about uh, how I'm still alive somehow. Uh, <laughs> with My travels over the past month have been a bit kind of insane. Um, I had to travel abroad for uh, top surgery or a double mastectomy is more of the scientific term uh, to Poland during a pandemic. So that's the whole kind of uh, the whole kind of buzz we're going on currently, um, because unfortunately in Ireland at the moment, there is uh, no one who will um, do top surgery for trans masculine people. So we have to kind of outsource our healthcare kind of outside of Ireland, unfortunately. So I'm sorry, I, mean, like, I, I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm just curious. Do you get yeah, any supports for, for that at all? Because a lot of, um, you know, the way some stuff mm, is covered in the HSE if you just land into the hospital or whatever. So um, for no, for like for for a, a break or something. So comparatively, do you get any kind of support from the state on that? Um, see, the thing is, in regards, you can get the cross-border directive, whereas you kind of get money back if you fly, but it's kind of strict criteria criteria sorry so it's like you have to get invoices and stuff and you know it's wow. quite like you know you've invoices and you have to have a consultation you have to get a referral and it's quite difficult because if you can't get a referral you can't avail the money back so and you have to remember that some people are waiting four years and um, just to be seen publicly okay should we just get hormones so uh, a lot of people have to wait four years publicly and then if they can't get on that list a lot of people just do it by themselves so they can't get the referral so they can't get the money back so I mean it depends it depends on situations you know um I was lucky my GP referred me um you know just as like kind of a thing where he said like oh I'm going with uh my friend Noah Halpin you know so I was lucky because you do need a referral to get through um airport the airport as well we haven't gotten to the airport but wait you know wait till we get there yeah but, sorry um, I totally interrupted the start of the story just yeah yeah, go, yeah there's, from, there's go so... right from the start did, yeah, I mean, I could still talk about like healthcare. I mean, there's not that many, there's not that, um, there's no one in Ireland that will do and support wise. I mean, you've got the likes of like Tenny and stuff, but like financially, 
um, not really. You've got the treatment abroad scream as well. But again, like that's something like a lot of people have to wait years before they're seen. Um, my story, I suppose, before I even get straight into it, I can tell you I came out when I was um, quite late in life. You know, I was about 18, but I didn't fully come out to everyone until I was uh, 21. So I've been out for about three and a half years now, you know. So um, I kind of decided when I came out, publicly to everyone that I wanted to kind of transition under the radar for a while so I got on the list when I was about 20 so I was already on the list for you know for a while before and now I'm see I'm, I'm publicly seen uh, by uh, not by the National Gender Service who is in Dublin but I'm seen by um, a consultant in Drada so I suppose I was lucky in that way that like you know I, I have my healthcare here but when it came to top surgery I didn't so I had to go privately I decided to go to Poland um, but again, the cost of it was six thousand five hundred euro. Now that was everything all inclusive. I know, but that's really good. That's probably the cheapest option uh, the transmasculine people have. Um, so for myself, I was quite lucky that uh, my friend Noah and a few other of my friends within the union and stuff shared my GoFundMe and ended up raising it. So I was very grateful. Um, but the first time around, this is my second time having to get surgery because the first time I went to England, uh, I got a double mastectomy, but he left an extreme amount of tissue and breast tissue included in skin and stuff in, in my chest still. Oh, so God. I had to get like a revision. Yeah. So I had to get two surgeries, whereas normally people would just get like the one, but I had to get a full kind of chest reconstruction again, just <gasps> last month. And is that so like I'll not a bit negligent of the first guy? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm not going to name names of surgeons. Yes, I, yeah. I'll name my, my surgeon in Poland, but I won't name the surgeon in England, but um, definitely negligent. Um, and I, it cost me about, just for the surgery alone, it cost me eight and a half grand for that surgery <gasps> in England. Jesus. Uh, so, and then obviously time off work and everything, it cost me about nearly 11 grand. Oh, God. Because I had to pay for, you know, food, flights over, etc. And then I paid, that's why I mean, I'm so grateful that people kind of, gave me a dig out for the six, six and a half grand for everything included. And that was including bringing my friend Noah with me to Poland uh, for uh, about 11, 12 days. So that, that was a very long time. I was very grateful. But um, currently in all aspects of healthcare regarding, or not even healthcare, but in regarding like, you know, name change and everything, uh, me just being trans has cost me about 15 grand. So, um, and I got that loan out um, when I was 22. So, wow. I mean, yeah, tough going. But um, that's not even into the main story yet. <laughs> like when we get into the whole kind of COVID related one, I mean, it gets it gets worse. I mean, you know, I, mean, I was grateful that, um, like I said, and I'm still grateful to this day because I know a lot of people, especially students who are trans, can't access healthcare at all because, you know, maybe they're not out where they don't have funds or whatever. But when it came to me, again, I was lucky that I know and I'm lucky I've got support of friends and uh, I booked my flights and I've been on the waiting list uh, for this surgeon in particular in Poland, Dr. Lembas, for about a year and a half now. So before, like even before COVID hit, I was on that waiting list because I just knew I wasn't comfortable with the way my chest looked after the first guy really botched it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be honest, really botched it. Um, but I was grateful. I do not regret one thing people ask me is I do not regret the first surgery because my chest was a 38 double F, I believe. Well, I hadn't measured it in a while, but kept, wow. it was quite big. Yeah, it was quite big F, I think. Uh, sorry I, I don't really remember but it was definitely the last time I checked that's what it was and it had gotten bigger since then but he took off about two and a half kg in the first time the first surgery in England and the second time when I got it done last month he took an extra kg off. wow so yeah so that's a lot yeah so even though the first one didn't go quite right it was still a big like weight that got physically, taken off yeah. and, and I mean I mean that physically not not metaphorically yeah <laughs> Yeah, a bit both. I mean, metaphorically, it was good because I didn't have to bind, and uh, binding is like you know, chest binding. It's like yeah, a, that must have been compression. hard with big boobs. Yeah, extremely. Yeah, they were quite sore, <laughs> quite. And I, I have I have a lot of damage to my like posture and ribs and stuff. And I know people who double bind, so they wear two Oof, like yeah. kind of like compression vests. I suppose that people don't really understand. But um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the best. So I, I knew the first surgery, even though it didn't go to plan, it helped me because I didn't have to do that, you know. But um, I'm grateful now that I have had the surgery. But um, I suppose like when I booked everything pre-COVID, I didn't expect it, you know, to be a thing because my mental health after the first one, you know, you expect the whole hype. I've spent my whole life wondering, you know, what my chest would look like. And then all of a sudden it's not what I expected. And I hyped it up because uh, I was grateful that my friend, 
Roisin O'Donovan, who was the vice president for welfare at the time, who I was there, and Rebecca Gorman and Jess Morris, they all had a fundraiser for me. And um, we raised money for me to get the first surgery. And every, we made this big hype about it. And then all of a sudden I wasn't happy and I had to be all, oh, I'm grateful, you know. And my mental health just got really shit, to be honest with you, because I was meant to be this big, you know, oh, look, if you only got a surgery and it just, I wasn't happy. Yeah. So I booked this, I, like I said, I booked this reconstruction surgery, COVID hit, and I was really depressed. So I was like, oh, I don't know if I can go for this. And then country started opening up and, you know, like I was like, right, okay, this is good. You have to get, um, a COVID test before you fly and when you're over there new regulations came in before you come home to Ireland to get another COVID test I was like right that's not too bad right surely it's not going to be that bad right uh no because it's me <laughs> life has to throw a few sticks in my way and um unfortunately my uncle the end of January got COVID and went missing for a few days he ended up being in hospital really sick and I live with my aunt and my uncle and um with the uncle that got COVID Yes, and I was oh dear not I was not about to have this two weeks before surgery as well. Oh, so I knew okay. if I got COVID, I couldn't have surgery. So I decided right, let's isolate in my room. So that meant you know very restrictive movements like the kitchen downstairs. He would be he ended up coming home and out of hospital. They let him home early, and they, he would have been in the kitchen. He would have been in the bathroom. I was like, what am I going to do? And then my aunt ended up getting COVID as well, who I live with. So I was like, right, nah, I hope what what are we going to do? So I was like. Grant. So I booked an Airbnb for about a week and a half before flying and it cost me 550 euro. So I isolated by myself and then I decided, right, we're going to get COVID tests. That was really so, clever. Sorry, I just want to say that. I, I, I would have been like, oh yeah. my God, what to do? That was really clever. I didn't think of that. Oh, yeah. I think I think it was such a thing because I knew I was going to an Airbnb in Poland and I was like, Airbnb in Dublin, of course. But there, that's a whole nother story. You can get someone else's story about Airbnbs <laughs> in Dublin yeah, because yeah. the price for a week and a half. It was ridiculous, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was another hole in my pocket, but um, I got a COVID test privately then. I actually got two privately, and then I got the close contact one as well. So I got three COVID tests within one week, all negative, thank God. And then I had to get another COVID test just before I flew as well. So my poor nose, Jesus Christ. So I got all negative, thank God. And then um, I was grateful that I could fly with all my documents. You know, I had like my my surgeon I had like my GP I had my other GP I had all the documents say it was essential travel because you know like I said it is it's not you can't get this healthcare in Ireland and we flew I got a um another COVID test again before surgery and again negative and then I got the surgery so always always going pretty well you know coming up to surgery and um, the healthcare in Poland I have to say is brilliant quite efficient quite fast and um, you know blood samples 30 seconds you know Everything was great, and I have a fear of blood, so I was very, very happy that it was in and out. Um, and just out of curiosity, and um, did they speak did, English? Were they speaking? Yes, were they, well, yeah, well, yeah. Some did, some did. Well, I mean, the health, the hospital, the nurses in the hospital broke uh, broken English, and then my surgeon was fluent in English. He's very good English, oh, and his okay. nurses have very good English. Yeah. Now again, some nurses like I mean, the the nurse who checked me and didn't have good English, but she had the app, you know, where you speak in Google Translate, and then it it relays it out, and then you oh, speak. No way! Oh my god, that's yes. so handy. And because you know, the thing is, he actually said to me, uh, the surgeon was like, "We are he, he that specific surgeon, Doctor Lemba said, we are the I think it's the highest number of surgeries he does." is from trans uh, masculine people in Ireland. And that's a couple of thousand, it's a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand he's done. And mm-hmm. I was like, that's that's insane. And he was like, yeah, and I'm a cosmetic surgeon. He does, he does everything you name it. He does, you know, if you want, you know, liposuction, if you want a nose job, rhinoplasty, whatever, ears tucked. He does it all, but his most busiest is trans people. And I was like, I can't believe that because, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you can do anything, you know, but it was just because he's the most popular kind of choice for trans yeah. people in Ireland at the moment. But like, like I said, like he, I was lucky that he, he's great English, you know, healthcare there is really good. Very quick, very, you know, this is uh, no, no judgment, which is what you need, you know, yeah. like if you're going in, even for yourself, like if you want to talk about certain things, you don't want your GP being like, you know, <laughs> I sent no question, you know, like he was pretty cool, especially as well, like I'll touch on quick, quickly enough, like, you know, being in Poland, I was a bit nervous because of all the hate crime, the LGBT hate crime coming out as well. Yeah. But no, I had, a, I, it was pretty good. He's a really good guy. Um, I mean, I got a few looks, but I'm pretty sure that's the blonde uh, tips I've got in my hair. I don't blame <laughs> I, every, everyone gives me looks because of my blonde tips. They think I'm from NSYNC or something, but I don't blame I, like them. <laughs> I don't blame them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I don't blame them. It wasn't because it was trans because it was, we're like, you know, 
part of the LGBT community, it was definitely the blonde tips. <laughs> but um, you know, but, but but when I got the surgery anyway, I was grateful. You know, I mean, it was cheap enough. You know, because you know the last surgery in comparison, eight, yeah, yeah, it was eight and a half. You know, just for surgery. So this surgery cost me about three and a half, nearly four, and then everything else like yeah. six, six and a half altogether. But um. Everything went fine until I had my reveal anyway. So my reveal was about a week later and he realized, you know, look, it's a little bit of buildup of fluid. It's not quite yet a seroma, but which is like a buildup of fluid, but there's fluid and we'll just drain it for you. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, and again, I got a COVID test with my friend Noah and we were very grateful again to be negative. So we flew home. Now, unfortunately, on the that was now the day I got the mini fluids Roma thing drained we had to fly home because again I didn't have enough money to yep. stay longer I, I wish I could have obviously but like that I mean I've got work to do I've got many I've got I've got a life going on I mean I can't afford it you know and um, so I went we flew home uh, on the plane now I have to say on the plane there and on the plane back I have to say it was terrible there was no social distancing there was no cut off seats like on the bus here if anyone's at the bus or the dart in Dublin or, or in Ireland like the bus air and I know seats are cut off not on planes no that wasn't a thing and uh, people were told if you want to eat you could take your mask down not wear your mask you know like stuff like this I was like that's disgraceful no washing of the hands you know so I was like this isn't you know I'm a type 1 diabetic this isn't okay and my friend no he's asking us so he asked the guy beside him who wasn't wearing a mask to put it on and we called the the lady like three or four times you know and then eventually Noah got up and said look listen if this person doesn't put a mask on he's putting us at risk and unfortunately that was about 45 minutes of you know arguing with him to get him moved or call airport police and this is an ongoing thing and it was just that was on the way home and unfortunately we like I said we tested negative but like I, I'm pretty sure I, I was isolating like because we were so nervous again getting the, the and we isolated when we came home straight like we got we came straight home uh, I isolated Noah's house but fortunately um we ended up testing positive for coronavirus and I'm 100% it was on the plane. Um, Because unfortunately, when I, like I said, before I left Poland, I had a seroma, it was a buildup, and it ended up getting extremely worse. Now, for people who don't know what a seroma is, it's like I said, it's a buildup of fluid, like it can get infected quite easily. It can turn to sepsis if it's not treated or drained. And it was quite nice. large. So I went to A&E on um, the Monday and they did a routine swab of coronavirus, you know, like COVID tests on it unfortunately tested positive and um, I was extremely ill you know but I wasn't sure if that was the COVID or if that was the uh you know seroma you know so yeah uh, they're quite similar in their um symptoms but um really it was well, yeah so I mean like the exhaustion you know because I thought I was infected so yeah. you know exhaustion you know similar kind of infection kind of stuff you know like I didn't have a temperature but my blood levels being a diabetic were uh oh, really God, high yeah that how did that play into it um, not the best, to yeah. be honest. My blood, my blood levels. I actually became for two weeks uh, nearly immune to insulin. Oh which my is god, not good. that's not good. Was, no, no, no. I was extremely ill um, because of it, so I um, had to like double up on insulin like three times the amount I've ever had to take. You know. Oh my god. But um, and you know, I was grateful that like my team, my diabetic team, were there to help me. But um, on the first day when I went to A and E, you know they. They said to me, look, you've got COVID, you know, whatever, you'll have to, you know, isolate at home, whatever. And I said, look, I've got this seroma and that's causing me the most pain at the moment. Like when I mean pain, it's like someone had a knife in my chest, like it's sharp, achy, painful, you know, I mean, plus it's just come out of surgery, right? You know, I mean, a week, a week later, it's not, it's not ideal. And um, they told me, no, you can't, there's nobody here to do this. We actually, we're not going to do it. And they said also because you've flown abroad. And I said, okay, I understand the flying abroad, but I actually don't have healthcare in Ireland. I'm trans. And they were like, well, since you've accessed healthcare abroad, we don't have any aftercare here for you. And I said, oh well, that's God. not fair. I mean, I, I'm, I said, I'm an Irish citizen. Like, what can I do? Like, if I've got a seroma here, if this was anywhere else. And they were like, no, they refused actually, first of all. That's crazy. To, like, like what, if you, what if you died? I'm not saying Look, that I don't know whether that, that kind of thing, I, like, I don't know how serious they can get, but like, hypothetically, like, would they just be like, oh, sorry. You yeah, but again, you should remember, I'm also, crazy. yeah, but I mean, I'm not, the, I mean, trans people aren't the only people I'm more concerned as well. Like, yes, trans people access healthcare abroad, but there's other people who access healthcare abroad for other reasons, all you know, time. as well. Yeah. There's a lot of, yeah, there's sick people like all the time, you know? So like, if they came abroad, were you going to say the same thing, you know? And they were like, 
being a bit weird then. And I explained, look, listen, the HSC cross border scheme is what I'm trying to avail of here. I was sent, you know, abroad by the HSC and I've been, you know, got the OK. And then they eventually were like, OK. And then I mentioned, look, I'm a diabetic as well. And then it was only when they were like, hmm, you know, you know, it, was, it took a bit of bargaining, to be honest. Yeah, with you you're very lucky that you, that you knew your stuff about like those schemes and things. And I, exactly. But I mean, you shouldn't have to argue. In regards no, to I agree party, totally. Yeah. So um, eventually they let me in and then refused me and told me to come back um, the next day when they could, you know, refer me on to the breast clinic because they didn't know what to do, you know. And I said, OK. And then I came in the next day and I was grateful that they actually did drain this aroma. But again, I was waiting in. Like, they put you in this big isolation room with like the lock seals. Everyone comes in and wears, you know, which is completely, completely. And they were in a full you know, thing or just like masks? Oh, no, the full, the full get up, you know, because again, they you remember I tested positive. They were the full get up, are they? Yeah, they have the they've the mask, they've the what visor and the, the overbody thing. I mean, of course, I mean it's it's coronavirus. Like you got to you have to wear your mask and everything and gloves and hand sanitize and you wear your mask. Of course, like I I don't want anyone else to be sick. Uh, I just wish your man on the plane just wore his mask and I presume <laughs> yeah. this wouldn't be happening. Like uh, that's but, um, terribly uh, traumatic as well though, because you're you know oh, yeah. you're in pain and then they're full. Rig out. Uh, you look. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I don't. I didn't mind them doing that. I mean, they had to do it to keep themselves safe. Yeah. And you know, I just wanted the seroma. I just didn't want to be there for long because I wanted it. You know, the drain the fluid and stuff. And the breast team came down and they drained it. You know, that was fine. But within the twenty four hours that they actually made me wait from the Monday to the Tuesday, the seroma had actually like halved you know and it ended up getting extremely it's like rock on my side like it, it made it, it like went from fluid to like rock it was really weird and they were like oh you know when they were drained they were like oh i've seen bigger oh i don't know you know making some comments like this and i was kind of getting annoyed and i was like just drain the thing yeah. and eventually after you know they were like we're not going to do it and i went crazy i was in so much pain i was like you are going to do this right now or I was like, I will see you. I went full car and I was like, I am fucking Sue. Like, I was like, I, I'm, so, I'm in pain. Oh, I went crazy. And they eventually did. But they only drained my one, the left side. And I was like, I'm getting annoyed now. because Was it on both I'm, sides? It's Yeah, it was both sides. And it was the side and in the middle. So you touch one side and the whole fluid would move around. And it was like, it was like a whole swimming pool in there at one point, you know. And I was getting real, real, uh, real annoyed. And um Eventually, they drain just to one side, and it, it, it feels a lot better. It's like it's like it's like a blister, you know, a big blister. Yeah. So you can only imagine, yeah, you know, when a blister really hurts and it's yeah. sharp, and it's just imagine that, but on your chest, and it's like huge. Like it's literally they drained three hundred mLs, I think it was, out of my <gasps> chest. Wow. And the first, yeah, that but they said that was small, and I was like, are you kidding me? That was three hundred mLs I didn't need in the one side of my chest, you know. But um, then eventually, um, they told me, look you're on you're being sent to plastics so um i said okay and then the breast clinic were like listen we'll also look after you in a bit and i was like right but again they're being a bit iffy and a bit weird and i went home and i was trying to deal with the whole covid thing and i was ringing up every day being like where's my appointment because it's getting bigger again because the minute you when you waste around it if you drain it you constantly have to drain it for like a week my surgeon actually recommended once a week in Poland. They would have, if I stayed for like another two weeks, they would have done it once a week or as many times as needed just to like get it out. Um, but they said to me, look, when I rang up the hospital again, I said, look, listen, I'm getting quite annoyed. I think it was five days at this point and I was ringing and ringing and saying, look, where's this appointment? Because, you know, A&E, if you leave A&E, if you're discharged, you usually get an appointment there and then, but I didn't. Turns out that they discharged me from both clinics without me knowing. And I had been ringing to look for an appointment that was never made for me because they felt that, no, he doesn't need another another fluid draining, even though I had requested, because again, I was in pain and the recommendations of my surgeon. And he just said, no, we're not doing it. So I was like, look, I'm getting in a lot more pain. And eventually during this whole time, um, I was grateful that COVID had passed. So we're looking at about two weeks now, you know, um, you know, I was like, right, okay. And eventually I went home because I was staying in Noah's and again, the fluid's building up and I'm in a lot of pain again. So I decided, right, I'm going to have to go to AD. And I went to my local hospital, a &E there, and I explained the situation, everything to them. And they brought me in. And again, like I said, it's it, this aroma kind of hardened. And I went in and they said to me, look, we ran the hospital you were previously at and they told us not to do anything. So we can't do anything for you here. Ugh. And I said, I'm in a lot of pain here and it's really sore. And we ended up finding out that what happens with seromas, they harden, they like solidify kind of, and 
you can form abscesses and I now currently have like two large abscesses on either side under my arms on both sides of my chest because the fluid wasn't drained. So she tried to have a look and tried draining them as well. But again, it's too thick at the moment. So I was grateful. Shout out to the nurse and the doctor in, in Tal Hospital. They were grateful. They tried. They really tried to help me, but they couldn't because I'd been left so long without treatment. And this treatment that I was supposed to get, this drained, it would have would have stopped all these problems. So now my my issue is um, I'm kind of stuck in a weird limbo of like I've got two abscesses on my side now. They're quite painful. Did they, you can't really do anything with. You can't. They're like, I've got a stitch abscess, who's one of them, and the other is just an abscess. And you kind of just have to let it dissolve into your body. And again, I was waiting in a and I think, in Tala for 12 hours or something, nearly. And they said to me, look, listen, I said, if you don't do anything, I emailed my surgeon while I was in the waiting room. I should probably add to the story. And I said, what will I do? And I was explained to him, like, they won't do it. I've been refused before, and they won't do it. And he said, look, listen, if this gets so bad, you're going to have to drain it. And he actually sent me a letter and he or sent me a letter. So he sent me an email and we don't do letters anymore. Right. Um, <laughs> he sent me an email and it was like, look, here's the gauge of the needle you get. If you can get your hands on a needle, I would suggest you do it yourself. And I said, oh, my I, God, I said, I can't do it. I cannot do that. I could hit something, you know, whatever. And now, again, it's no fault of the surgeon. He just it's so common. Yeah. In Poland, you can walk into any GP and they can drain for you. And my GP said, no, you have to go to a and &E, And a and &E said, no, you have to go here. Like, there's a lot of tossing around in Ireland, whereas in Poland and other EU countries, they just go up to a GP and they do it, you know? So I told the doctor in the hospital that I was in, in Tala, I said, look, listen, if I'm going to do this myself if you don't do it. And I'm pretty sure that's the only reason that somebody tried to, I like, got called within the next 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not, like, it's that's not okay. That's a bad idea, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not fair. I mean, if, if No, it's definitely not fair. Clearly threatened, people to threaten themselves, you know, to be like, okay, listen, I'll do it myself. So unfortunately at the moment, um, I'm stuck in this weird limbo of like, I still don't have aftercare in Ireland and I've got two abscesses that are quite sore. When you move, I can't move properly. Um, I can't reach a certain height, but again, I just had surgery, but again, I should have been healed by now, but I can't because I've got these abscesses and I don't know if anyone's ever had an abscess, but that's extremely sore. Never mind getting two of them, you know? So, um, but yeah, no, the lack of healthcare in Ireland for trans people is actually, you know, diabolical at this point, because now if you go abroad to get the healthcare that we, you know, need and we come home, no one's going to treat us because they see us as like an other, you know, and I was told by the doctor here, you know, why did you go abroad? Don't you have this here? And I said, we actually don't, you know, there was a public uh, surgeon in Ireland that's actually retired and people are being uh, referred to a public surgeon that doesn't exist. You know, they're being referred, you know, to this like person that's no longer here. There's a private surgeon in Ireland for her. Um, her cost is from nine to 12 grand, you know, anyway in between there. But again, her criteria is quite strict as well. And her waiting list is quite long. Whereas, you know, in Poland and a lot of people are going to like Spain, Greece, you know, across Europe and stuff. Even some people are going as far as, you know, America. But again, when you come home, if you have any complications, you know, you're fucked. If I'm going to be honest, yeah. you're really fucked because they don't, they don't like, they don't see you. And they always, you always get weird questions like, oh, why did you have a double mastectomy? You don't need one. Cause you know, I pass quite well. You know, I don't tell everybody I'm trans. It's not nobody's business. They're like, oh, you pass really well. You know, like, why would you, a man need one? I'm like, mm, and it's an awkward, embarrassing conversation of like me trying to whisper through the, the glass and be like, your hands because it's you don't want to be you know I don't want to be discriminated against I don't want to be attacked you know it's happened before so I don't I don't want anything like that to happen again when I'm just trying to get healthcare the in Poland you can literally walk into your GP and they do it for you for, for yeah anything nothing so God, yeah, so that so was, that's, yeah that was some experience definitely not not my best one to be honest <laughs> I could have I've had better experiences but uh not my favorite experience and um yeah, unfortunately, I think at the moment, um, in regards to trans healthcare in Ireland, you know, I think we need to pick up the pace. I think, you know, if you do send people abroad, you know, which we shouldn't be, I mean, bodily autonomy and stuff, we, we said that we wouldn't be sending anyone else abroad for any any sort of healthcare. But yet here we are, you know, a few years later, we're still sending people abroad for healthcare, which I think is absolutely disgraceful. But if you're going to send people abroad, can you at least give them the healthcare as an Irish citizen or as an Irish person or, you know, anyone deserves healthcare? When they come home you know yeah, and that was I my big thing that. I was that's upset. crazy to me yeah i was already upset having to go abroad and i was already stressed 
you know, having to fly for surgery in the first place, which is extremely nerve wracking as well. Yeah. And especially by yourself, you know, I was grateful. And especially during there. COVID, even worse. Even worse, you know, and the finance, the finances weren't great either. And, you know, like 700 quid I spent on COVID tests. Like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> 700 quid, you know, and then like having to go in, like, I mean, I remember like with my friend Noah, he was saying to me, look, I wish I could be in the room with you when you woke up and, you know, I wish I was there. Like, there was none of that. I was alone for the whole, like for a good, like 48, nearly 48 hours, oh, you know. Yeah, because he wouldn't, he wasn't know? allowed in to see you, was he not? Yeah, it, there, no, he wasn't, you know, until like I was fully ready and stuff like and I'm aware there's a lot of people who are in the same boat as me like they like going into surgery it's scary you know you want to be able to wake up to your loved ones or wake up to somebody and it's scary enough as it is you know just going for surgery but then I had you know COVID on top of it and I was in another country and then there was a little bit of a language barrier and it was just it was just shite to be honest yeah, with you you know a lot I wish, to have to deal with yeah exactly and I wish um I really wish it was I wish it was at home I wish I was able to go home after into my own bed have have my mom or have my family members around me and to be like, are you doing okay? You know, because I have a bit of a moan myself. I wish, oh, make me a cup, you know, make me a cup of coffee, you know. <laughs> yeah. There was none of that. There was none of that, you know. I mean, it, it was tough. It was a tough going kind of experience. And the fact that I had to do it twice wasn't wasn't my favourite thing because, you know, I fully believe that anyone has the right to, they should have the right to healthcare in Ireland, regardless of if they're trans or not, you know. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, I think, I think it's just something... The, the community were were used to unfortunately and I hate using that word like you know or I hate using the word like I had to get the Irish people here to believe me you know yeah. I hate that word because I had to nearly convince them that I had the right to healthcare here yeah and that really really pissed me off because you know it's I'm going to A&E for a seroma why why did you make it such a big deal whether I'm trans or not you know yeah I also don't really understand why they why in particular, you said that like the hospital were like, we've talked to the previous hospital. So you've just explained to a hospital that the previous hospital failed you. And then the new hospital is like, well, we actually just asked them there, you know, what they thought. And they said, we should fail you too. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me. I know, but I was, I was very grateful. That really annoyed me actually, but I was very grateful that the girl who was there um, did her best, you know, she yeah. could do what she said. She actually said to me, that's not right. She was like, uh, and she knew there was, there was definitely a little bit of transphobia in there from the previous hospital. Cause she was very much like, I've seen, she said, I've seen a lot of women, you know, who've had breast cancer come into me with seroma. So she was fully aware of what it was. Yeah. And she was like, so I'm going to do my best and treat it as if it's a seroma, you know, it's the same thing. She, she said, you know, like to drain them or to do this. She was like, I can do my best, you know? And she was, I'm very, I'm very grateful that she did try and help me, but she definitely got some kind of a, uh, feedback from the previous hospital who were like no don't treat them it was definitely like transphobia because I mean they, they definitely made like it out to be like oh he's a man so da, 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 da. you know what I mean oh da, da, da. where she turned to me and was like you know it's it's as if any patient come has come in here with double mastectomy I can do exactly what I, I know to do they just made a big deal out of it because they were like oh he's a dude you know yeah I'm like yeah no, just just drain it just do it you know <laughs> it's painful you know I, I, I want some help here but um yeah, no, in Tala, they were pretty, they were pretty good. Um, they were, she, she really did help me in all fairness to her. And, uh, well, do you know what you're going to do next? Like, uh, with the abscesses or what, what, what's your next move? Yeah, so she told me that, like I said, the doctor told me that with the abscesses, they kind of have their stitch abscesses, so they just have to be left alone. So it's just uh -huh. painkillers. It's, you just have to kind of leave just, it be, you know. And have you any idea how long that's going to go on for? No, not really. Like it could take a couple of weeks. But the thing is with the fluid that's still left in my chest, my surgeon in Poland and the doctor who was quite helpful there, like I said, Patala said to me, look, listen, um, it's going to be a few months before that fully, you have to, your body has wow. to absorb it. So unfortunately, if I just got it drained, I wouldn't have this issue of having to wait a few months before, you know, it absorbs into your body, you know. But in regards to what I'm doing now is I'm kind of, you know, um, physically with my body, I can't really do anything else. I just have to rest up. I've got to, you know, um, let let everything absorb. You know, but in regards to like maybe some po politics, <laughs> some politics, I uh, I've really tried to um, push my story, and I've written some articles. I've done this great podcast. Ooh, wow! And I've done some other uh, podcasts as well, it's just to get the story out. And I know my friend Noah helping is doing the same thing. You know, we're pushing for like um, pushing to HSC. You know, kind of 
to get some trans healthcare, you know, I mean, like, you know, there's a diagnostic model as well. They're kind of going to at the moment and, you know, it's not fair, you know, it's not best practice. It's not best standards uh, from WPATH. So like we're doing stuff like that as well. And even to get the aftercare at home, I mean, we sent a little, we did our union, uh, like I said, I worked for TW Students Union and I was working closely with USI to like send some um, some emails, you know, to do like stuff like that, you know, just, I mean, there's not much you can do during, like during COVID, you know, we just send a few emails to a few DEDs open for gender recognition and then also send them to the leadership team and the HSC, you know, open, you know, for, for somebody to kind of start this conversation because it's something that's kind of, I don't want to say it's an uprise, but it's nice to kind of see at the moment people start to give a fuck about you. And I know that sounds, you know, brutal, but like, Yeah, but a bit of support and a bit of um, grassroots yeah. sort of groundswell towards change. Exactly. Like, definitely there has to be change, you know. I mean, um, I think people are compassionate, you know, and they're understanding because, you know, they understand, you know, everyone, you know, if you want to get healthcare, imagine being refused in your local A&E, like, or any, whatever, it's not great. No. So, I mean, I am grateful that people are really trying to help, but again, it's, it's, if they're not going to listen to, you know, one or two people, we need, we need a lot of people on board, you know, but, um, there's not much we can do, but keep fighting, spread messages, you know, um, in regards to maybe some transphobia, if anybody says, or even like homophobia or anything, you know, any, you know, any discrimination at all you know just getting people to stand up against it I think that's something that we all need to do you know if you see any you know racism if you see any like anything like that just stand up and kind of start a conversation be like no that's not right and when yeah. you kind of start doing it you're kind of being an active ally and that's something I spoke at recently at, um I did a I did a kind of like a conference and I spoke about active allyship versus just being an ally like you could say you're an ally all you want but are you going to be active about it you know you're going to stand up for people because you know, a lot of people hate me and they don't even know me as well, which really, really upsets me because you don't know my story, my life. I've been through a lot, but you think, you know, online, especially people just hate me because they think they know everything from like the article I wrote once yeah. or twice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And I'll put all the links that you mentioned just there down in the description. Perfect. Um and uh, yeah, just remind everyone where to find you online before we finish up. Of course. So on all social medias, it's you know Fionn. So you are N O Fionn. F I O N N, just for the Americans. Who don't know just just for, yeah, it's not Fionn. <laughs> F I O N N. Um, and I, but all the links will be down in the description on YouTube and in the show notes on the audio platform. So you should just be able to scroll down and click um, and find and follow. Thank you so much, Fionn, for coming on the podcast. Brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for listening. Uh, the Storytime podcast is available as a video podcast on YouTube. It's also on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify as an audio podcast. Um, and if you could give us a review on one of those platforms as well, that'd be great. Uh, so thank you so much, Fionn. And thank you. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye. This podcast was brought to you by The Shift. For more like this, check out theshift.ie.